Welcome back, everybody. Well, one of the most important topics we'll be covering on this episode is avian flu. We've received many phone calls and emails from you asking us all about it. So we attended a webinar that was conducted by the Wild Bird Feeding Institute. Dr. Bird has prepared a report, but we will also keep you posted if anything changes between now and the next episode. If you're someone who enjoys feeding birds as much as I do, you are undoubtedly a wee bit alarmed to read the growing numbers of media headlines announcing the outbreaks of avian influenza or bird flu. Here's what I know so far. But first, a bit of background on this virus. It apparently originated in southern China in 1996, mostly affecting poultry farms. Over the ensuing years, outbreaks all over the world came and went. While bird flu viruses do not normally infect humans, those working closely with domestic birds were most prone to catching the virus and even dying from it. Since 2003, the World Health Organization has received reports from 19 countries or more than 860 human infections with H5N1 bird flu viruses, with just over half resulting in death. No human infections with H5N1 bird flu viruses have been identified in the U.S. and Canada, to my knowledge, but a mutated form known as H7N3 has reported to have caused mild avian influenza, but no deaths in a handful of cases. Thus far, unlike the COVID virus, avian flu is primarily an animal health issue and there's no need to panic. However, folks who feed wild birds need to take precautions where warranted. We love our birds and the last thing we want to do is harm them. So here are my recommendations based on what I know so far. You don't immediately need to cease all of your bird feeding activities and take your feeders down. This current outbreak of avian flu is not yet widespread and hopefully, as before, it will dissipate quickly. However, I would pay very close attention to any directives given out by your state and provincial health and wildlife authorities. Organizations like the Wild Bird Feeding Institute, the American Bird Conservancy, the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, along with the Humane Society and the SPCA, are all monitoring this situation very closely. If you see or hear announcements in your region recommending that you take your feeders down until the risk passes, then you should definitely heed that advice. Meanwhile, Keep a close watch on the health of the birds visiting your feeders, and especially so if you're also maintaining a flock of poultry or waterfowl. If you see any birds suffering from some sort of disease, then take your feeders down immediately. If you find any dead or dying birds below your feeders, please handle them carefully with rubber gloves and alert your local Humane Society, SPCA, or Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. And finally, as always, maintain a high level of hygiene with your bird feeding operation. This is not our first rodeo concerning disease outbreaks among our birds, but let's be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Florence Maine from Washington noticed that her Stella's jays started to mimic hawk calls. As you might know, blue jays do the same. So she's actually curious why jays do that. Is that because they want to let all the hawks know that the territory is already taken or are they trying to keep other feeder birds from visiting feeders, or maybe there are some other reasons. Hi Florence, you're absolutely correct in saying that Stellar's Jays and Blue Jays can mimic hawks expertly. In fact, Blue Jays are known to mimic the calls of eight different birds of prey, including red-shouldered hawks, red-tailed hawks, broad-winged hawks, and Cooper's hawks. They can also imitate the calls of bald eagles, ospreys, American kestrels, screech owls, and even fish crows. I wasn't able to find a list of the species that Stellar's jays mimic, but I would not be surprised to learn they can match the blue jays. While we can never be exactly sure as to why they do it, studies so far have come up with two main hypotheses. First, we do know that jays are a highly social species, and they look out for members of their own species carrying their genes. Thus, they could simply be warning other jays in the area that there's a hawk nearby. Second, they could also be a way of fooling other bird species in the area into thinking that there is a hawk nearby so that they fly away and leave all the food resources to the clever jays. This certainly would make sense in the case of bird feeders. I can think of two other plausible reasons though. Um, other famous mimics in the bird world like mockingbirds, thrashers, catbirds and starlings are said to imitate a wide variety of sounds, some natural and some even artificial, to show off their repertoires to prospective mates. The greater the mimicking behavior, the more likely they attract an impressed mate. What makes this behavior even more interesting is that they appear to do it during all seasons, 
and not just the breeding season, and sometimes even when there are no hawks or any other birds in the vicinity. Based on that observation, here's another potential hypothesis that came right out of my own head while pondering your question. Perhaps jays mimic hawks so as to take away their element of surprise. If all of the birds in the area hear the mimic making a raptor call, they'll be on full alert. That's making it pretty hard for a bird of prey to catch them off guard. There would be no point in sticking around then, would there? I suppose a lot of you in southern states have already been gardening for some time. Uh, here in Quebec, we're just gearing up for our gardening season. And in our household, one of the most important things is not to use any chemicals or pesticides. So on today's environment and for the next few episodes, we will be talking about things you can do to have a pest-free and a chemical-free garden. And of course, if you have any techniques, please share them with us. So today, let's talk about marigolds. There are three beneficial things these flowers have. First of all, they're so beautiful and they just brighten up any kind of outdoor space and they're so low maintenance. Second of all, their scent attracts a lot of pollinators and pollinators like wasps take care of aphids. These are little bugs that attack your beautiful plants. And thirdly, the roots of marigolds release this kind of chemical that is toxic to nematodes. These are little worms that attack the roots of your vegetable plants. And the best type of marigolds to take care of nematodes is the single gold. You can plant uh, these flowers directly right next to your vegetables. You can actually plant them two months before you start your vegetable garden. Or if you are moving your garden or you're gonna have, you have some spare beds, you can have just a full flower bed of marigolds and the following season, you won't have to worry about any nematodes. <music> I would be very surprised if you had never seen a hairy woodpecker in your backyard. Unless, of course, there are absolutely no trees in your neighborhood. Hairy and downy woodpeckers are resident birds that can be found pretty much everywhere in Canada and the United States. Both hairy and downy woodpeckers got their names because of the white lying on their backs. A hairy's line looks like hair, threads, or filaments, and a downy's line is soft, like down. It's pretty easy to distinguish uh, sexes of both species. Males have a red patch on their head and females don't. Hairy woodpeckers are longer, larger, and they have longer, stronger bills than downy woodpeckers. Another tip to distinguish male downy and hairy woodpeckers, but that's mostly in eastern parts of uh, North America, is to check their red patch. A hairy's patch seems to be split into two, and a downy's patch is completely solid. Even though I see hairy woodpeckers on my suet and nut feeders every single day, believe it or not, 75% of their diet all year round is insects and larvae that they extract from tree trunks and branches. Dead, dying, and decaying trees are very popular with hairy woodpeckers, but they do forage on live trees as well. These birds have a sweet tooth, so helping themselves to maple sap or nectar from hummingbird feeders is not that unusual. Pairs are monogamous and many of them will get back together for a number of breeding seasons. Hairy woodpeckers start breeding earlier than downy woodpeckers as early as late March in southern states, but on average it's uh, late April to early June. Females excavate nesting cavities and they prefer live trees with a certain degree of decay and fungus. One brood per season, she normally lays on average of four eggs. Both parents incubate, brood, and feed the chicks. And I always look forward to August because that's when parent hairy woodpeckers bring their fledglings to our feeders and show them around. Hairy woodpeckers like to roost in tree cavities and in nesting boxes. They are known to attack houses in the fall when excavating for roosting sites and then in the spring when excavating for nesting sites. They also tend to follow pileated woodpeckers and happily eat whatever is left behind. Time to say goodbye. Please remember to disinfect your bird feeders and your bird baths regularly. Our photo contest is still open. It's the thrush family. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks. Bye.